Good morning, Elevate family. I hope you had a nice Thanksgiving. I hope that you had plenty of food. I hope that you had family and fellowship and friends and fun. I hope that your Thanksgiving was everything that you wanted it to be. But I'm a realist. And I recognize in this room, and I'll, I'll look up here because that way nobody thinks I'm looking at them. There are some in the room that this Thanksgiving there was a seat that was vacant at the table because somebody they love isn't here anymore. I recognize that there are some here that maybe weren't invited back to the table. I recognize that during this Thanksgiving slash holiday season, while it is fun and joy and Hallmark movies all end in blissful happiness, that may not be the case for where you are today. And so, I want to look at the dangerous advent with you through maybe filtered eyes. Let me explain. I had the privilege of spending almost 10, 11 days with my grandchildren. We went up to Michigan and um, we wanted to, 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 to be there and to support the family. And the last night that we were there, Ryan, my grandson, three years old, cutest grandbaby ever. Sorry, guys, if you have grandbabies. But I, I just, just, he said, his mother asked, who do you want to put him to bed? And he says, Papa. Well, that was music to my ears. So we began the routine. Those of you that are parents and understand, we went, we brushed teeth. We got all of the teeth brushed, and that was an ordeal. We got that done. We got the PJs on. We read a book. After the book, we had prayer, and we prayed for the whole family, and we're laying on his bed, and he goes through that routine, covers on, covers off, covers back on, adjusts the pillows this way, that way, all around, and we were in there, and I did, I had Pandora on with soft Christmas music playing, and you could tell by his breathing that he was almost to sleep, and then he twitched and he said, Papa, will you be here in the morning? I have wrestled with that question ever since he spoke it to me. Because I believe that is the question that the humanity is asking. You see, the lover who has given everything longingly looks to their lover and says, will you be here in the morning. The adult child holding the hand of their aged parent who's laboring to breathe wonders secretly, will you be here in the morning? The divorcee who's lost all of their friends and their spouse Ask the question in the silence of the night, will my friends be here in the morning? The one who has just lost a job. God, will you be here in the morning? Friends, the dangerous advent begins to answer that question for us. And, and I love the, the series that Pastor Anthony has put together. I, I love the, the flow. And when he told me that we're dealing with the dangerous Advent, I don't think of the Advent as dangerous. But as we study, it may be dangerous to certain things. And I want to look. Last week, Pastor Anthony, if you didn't hear the sermon, go online. It's a, it's a powerful sermon. He talked about three different individuals or groups response to the advent he talked about herod 
and, and how Herod had fear in the context of the advent. And he talked about the Pharisees, the religious people, the religious leaders had apathy. And then the wise men, curiosity. And he challenged us to look again and to be changed by the advent. Today we're going to go deeper into the story. It's the dangerous advent act two. And we're going to look again at the story. The story that you know. The story that you've read hundreds of times. The story that I believe changes lives. And it is my prayer that today, my life, our lives, are changed as we come to Scripture again today. Pastor Anthony left off where our Scripture reading was read today. And it says here, when they had gone, and I'll use the ESV version, it's great. Now, when they had departed, we got to understand, who's the they? This is the magi or the wise men. They had come, they had brought gifts. When they had left, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Now, we got to do a little time out here. How how many of you ever had dreams? How many of you have had really, really, incredible dreams that you thought were so real that you, when you woke up, you weren't sure if it was, you had been dreaming or real. Anybody, any have those dreams? You see, in our culture, dreams are just dreams. My Greek teacher used to say, you probably ate too much pizza before you went to bed. But in that time, dreams meant something. And so as I come to this passage, I have to ask myself, How in the world does Joseph know that this dream is different from eating too much pita bread the night before? We got to go to chapter one. Would you pray with me as we open God's word together? Oh God, the God of the dangerous advent, be present today through the power of your Holy Spirit. Speak to us as you did to Joseph. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can read along. It'll be up on the screen as well. This is the birth, the birth of Jesus. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to go into verses uh, 18 and following. But we got to know the context, the context of what's going on. This is written by a former tax collector. Details are important to him. He's a tax collector who became a disciple, who became an evangelist, and now we meet him today as a writer, detailing information about the birth of Jesus. Now, friends, as you study your Bible, you'll understand that there are four Gospels, Only two of the Gospels talk about the birth of Jesus. Did you know that? Dr. Luke and tax collector Matthew. They have two different focuses. Dr. Luke is trying to tell the the, the Greek mind, the Gentile mind, that the, the Messiah has come. And he shows how the Jewish people recognized the Messiah. Matthew comes at it from a whole different angle. Matthew comes to the story of the birth of Jesus, and he said, he's writing to the Jewish mind, and he's saying, guys, you missed it. You missed the fulfillment of prophecy. And he shows how outside of the faith of Judaism recognizes the Messiah. And so here we are in, in chapter, chapter 1. It says, now the birth of Jesus took place this way. Do you know what this follows? Some of the old people in the room, like myself, do you remember the begats? Some of you have never heard of begats. What are you talking about, begats? In the King James Version, it said so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. And And so that became known as the begats. This first part of Matthew 1 is boring to us, but it's so important. Because it tells the lineage 
of Joseph, who is now going to be challenged in this passage to adopt the Messiah as his son. To a Jewish believer, this means everything because the Messiah comes through the lineage of David. And so you have this long history, and then you have now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But he was, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for what that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Let me pause here just for a second. This is so easy to read, but the preconceptions that that Joseph had are very similar to what you have. There was a little nursery rhyme type of thing that we used to sing in, in, in elementary school. I don't know that you've ever heard it before, but we used to say something like, um, Billy and Susie sitting in a tree. K-I-S- See, as somebody who knows it, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. You remember the rest? First comes what? Love, Love then comes? Marriage. And then comes? So you guys know this. Joseph knew it too. I don't know if he probably had a Hebrew version of it or Aramaic version. I don't know. But you have to understand, this is how they thought, okay? Just like us. So tell me, you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table and you just blurt out, oh, by the way, yeah, we've been engaged now for three months and mom and dad, I'm pregnant. How's that going to go over? Your parents are going to say, yay! Yay! It doesn't work that way. And Joseph is a just man. For a moment, will you sit with me in Joseph's shoes? Can you imagine the betrayal? Can you imagine the hurt? Can you imagine the grief that he's feeling? Because Joseph knows one thing. It isn't his. And so he could just take her to the magistrate and do it very publicly. That was okay. He could do that. The culture said that was fine. Or he could just get two witnesses and do it on the side, down low. And he's wrestling. Which way do I go? I I, I think I should go this direction. And I believe that when Joseph lays down his head on the bed, he's asking God, Will you be there in the morning? And you see, God can't wait on something like that. He intervenes by sending an angel directly. And look what the angel does. The angel comes to him, and the angel says, Joseph, son of David. The angel's not playing around. He calls him by name. He tells him the family tree. He knows he's a just man, and he goes right to it. And he says, I know who you are. I know who is your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, all the way through. And I know you. And then, after telling him that he knows him, he says, let's not have the preconceived ideas be the ones that dictate your thoughts right now. I want to invite you to look at this from another perspective, Joseph. I want you to see it through God's eyes. And the angel gently takes him. Take Mary as your wife. Do it. And then what I want you to do, because the Holy Spirit's been involved, I want you to take this child, and I want you, Joseph, to name the child. That means adopt the child. And you know what's really cool about the story? Joseph wakes up in the morning and he does exactly what the angel says. You see, that's scene one. Scene one is the fact that God is coming through 
the angel speaking about relationship. What he's asking Joseph to do is to form that relationship, to keep the relationship between him and God pure. He was to reach out to Mary and to Jesus. It is relationship. It is a perception adjustment of who the people are in his world, Mary and soon-to-be son. And Joseph does exactly what he's asked. And and so I I, want to, it begs to be questioned. Joseph was careful who he listened to. Even though his perception had to be changed by the dangerous advent, he chose to listen. So church, elevate. Who are we listening to? What voices? And and somebody's going to say, oh, Pastor Russ, if God would come to me in a dream, man, I'd be right all over it. Let's see. Scene two. Scene two gets us to to chapter two, and we're looking at the verses that we read for our scripture. And it says here, when they had left. Okay? That's the wise men. And, And forgive me, we have to do a little bit of a background on this. We have to look a little bit deeper. When they had departed, that's the wise men, God has given, answered uh, Joseph's question, will you be there in the morning? He's answered it clearly. How do I know that? Well, Dr. Luke tells us that it, it, the night Jesus is born, the shepherds come and meet Jesus. What a, what a validation, okay? A couple days later, when they take Jesus to be uh, to the, dedicated in the temple, Anna and Simeon recognize Jesus. And then fresh off of that, the wise men come. Sometime up to maybe a year later, the wise men recognize Jesus as Messiah and they bring gifts. Things have never been so good for Joseph. Maybe it's time to relocate the family to Jerusalem or Bethlehem. There are good schools, good synagogues, good places around to be. It would be the right place to raise the Messiah. And God sends an angel and says, get up and get out of town. And you know what Joseph does? (laughs) He gets up and he goes out of town. And the, 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 the Greek there implies he does it in the middle of the night. And as he's packing, I'm guessing he's saying, Lord, will you be with me in the morning? And, and folks, before we go over, where does God send him? To Egypt. Now, come on, good Jewish believers. What happened in Egypt? Slavery. He's going back to the land where his people had come from. He had to say, hey, Egypt is a good place to be from. But God sends him back. And you know what Matthew says? This is to fulfill Scripture. In the first uh, first scene he ended, Matthew puts a commentary. This was to fulfill Scripture. The virgin will give birth. Now it's the, the, this is to fulfill scripture that Jesus would then come out of. Sometimes, friends, God calls us to places we may not want to go on our own. Who do you listen to? Priorities change in the dangerous advent. Scene three. We've got to go, go quickly here. Scene three is down a little bit further Verse 19, after Herod died, the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the family and his mother and go to the land of Israel. They had just gotten comfortable, maybe had a job in Egypt. This one may have been, it sounds easy, but it may not have been so easy. They're settling in, they're making friends. It doesn't say he got up in the middle of the night and left. There's a little bit of fear as you read the story about going back, and they're going back. They're not sure where they're going back to. But again, Matthew comments, this was to fulfill prophecy. 
you might be thinking, what does this have to do with us? These are great, three scenes. I, I, I would like to introduce you to a fourth theme foreseen in the dangerous advent. And it's the dangerous advent act two. You see, the fourth scene happens way after. Jesus has, has grown up. He's been to the temple. He's, he's preached great sermons. He's healed people. He's raised people from the dead. He has done all kinds of wonderful things. He died he rose again. He's hung out with the disciples. He has been ascended to heaven, and there is a delay. And years later, another disciple named John talks about the modern day Josephs. That's you, and that's me. And he says, God has sent not one angel, but three angels to us. You know them, Revelation chapter 14. We don't have time to unpack it. I've already gone over my time. But let me share, t share this. This is so cool. He talked to Joseph three times through angels. He's talked to us three times in angels. The first angel is about relationship. It's love God, worship God, respect God. The highest form of trust is worship. That's the first angel. And he's speaking it to modern day Joseph's. The third angel says, come out, get away, come away from, don't be a part of the enemy. And the middle angel says, confusion is fallen. You got to choose. You can choose God, you can choose the other way, but you got to choose. And Joseph experienced that in the dangerous advent. And the dangerous advent act two we have to choose. As I lay there on the bed with my grandson, I put my arm around him and I said, I'm going to be here in the morning. I love you so much. And you know what? God says the same thing to you, church. How do I know? Matthew told us so. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I have taught you. And guess what? The promise is still true. I'm going to be with you.